city where Chavez was born, the, the, you know, the Bethlehem of Chavismo. And what, when you're promoting an, an, uh, a narrative that things are getting better. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Hello everyone, welcome to a new episode of From the North. This is take two of this episode because well, things happen in Venezuela and electricity goes out. Um, this week, um, Hermana is not with us, she's busy, so I'm taking the reins this week and we have an interview with Tony Frangi. Tony, you want to introduce yourself again? Sure, um, well, I'm Tony. I'm also from Caracas, Venezuela, and I'm a journalist and political scientist. Um, I've written for... Venezuela and international media and Edu invited me he's been a long time Twitter friend he invited me to the program because uh, an article I wrote recently in Caracas Chronicles perfect thank you so much Tony so let's get yeah. straight to the point let me ask you the question that I asked you once again before uh, is Venezuela fixed well the simple answer is no clearly it isn't fixed the first time we tried to take this episode the lights went off in my home and We spend one hour without electricity. So no, it's not fixed. Um, so th the question comes from the fact that Venezuela, is its economy is growing for the first time in 80 years. It's growing around 9%, which is huge in a normal country. But Venezuela just experienced a, a contraction of 80%, which is something absurd outside, outside of war. So Venezuela should be growing around 400% to, to reach its pre-crisis levels, but it's just growing 7%. So Yeah, when you hit rock really, bottom and a 10% increase, doesn't really mean shit, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's a very mild recovery, but it has come in hand with a series of pro-market reforms done by the government. Um, they eliminated price controls, cur currency exchange controls, and they have done some sort of weird privatizations. So this has actually changed the mood in, in, in the country because now you see like supermarkets are full of every product you can imagine. Um, there's hundreds of new restaurants. There's international franchises entering the country, but at the same time, it's very, very unequal. So now the problem is not that you cannot find the products. It's the fact that most of the population cannot buy the products that you now can find. So, yeah, Venezuela is better than the previous years, but it's definitely not fixed. And it's in a very dire situation, especially politically, because these um, economic reforms have not come in hand with political reforms. Venezuela is still an autocracy. And as I said before, um, this year, 102 radio stations have been closed down by the government. Um, and, and there's practically no free institution. There's still no guarantees for free elections. So... Venezuela is definitely not fixed. Venezuela is not fixed. Short answer, <laughs> yeah. Venezuela is not fixed. Long answer is not fixed, but okay. Um, and so from my perspective, um, it has been pretty bizarre because I left the country in 2017. Um, that was, I think that was like just before we started seeing like this kind of like reforms in the economy from the country, right? Um, it started very informally started with people using U.S. dollars because currency, the, the, the Bolivar was uh, uh, worthless. Um, and little by little, we've gotten to this point where you start to see this kind of new reality that doesn't really apply to most Venezuelans. It applies to a select group of people and it somehow it trickles down, not enough, obviously, to um, the rest of the population. So what what has pushed the government in this direction because there's a lot of talks as to like what caused this because it, it when you see other nations that have had like maybe more um you know uh, collective type of economies like Ch china uh uh during the 60s and the 70s or even the soviet union 
up until the 80s when they change their course it's it usually happens it usually comes from 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 a place of very uh very very structured type of reform right like the we've talked about it and we even made jokes about it the, the perestroika in, in the soviet union uh dengis and in china whereas in venezuela i feel that it was more gradually and never really formalized uh, so what 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 do you think what in your opinion what has caused the government to take this direction yeah it's it's very informal it's very disorderly how it's being made it doesn't even have a name um so on one hand i do believe that the government was pushed by the total situation of of desperation and and chaos that the crisis unleashed in Venezuela because the first reform was taking down um, currency exchange controls in 2018. And that was exactly a year after the 2017 protest, which lasted a lot and involved a lot of sectors of the country. So the government realized that either they had to soothe down the economic situation or the country was just going to explode at some point. But I also think that sanctions were a an instrument of, of of stimulating these changes because um, most of them started to come after 2019. And that's because the oil, um, you know, the oil flush that the government had, um, it, it, it got cut down. So the traditional income of the government simply got greatly reduced, especially by 2020. There's a study by Thinkanova, which is a, a think tank here in Caracas, Anova policy um it's an uh, think tank, and, and they, they did this study in 2017 in which, well, they did it afterwards, but it, it studied 2017 and it compares that with the financial sanctions done by the U.S., there was a rise of food and medicine imports in Venezuela. So, so in a way, it's, it's the government adapting to a very adverse economic situation, both by their policies and by international sanctions. So I, I want to take you on, on that because I think that's, that's an interesting conversation that... If you're not an expert on what's happening in Venezuela, or you know, if you're not a Venezuelan and you know you haven't seen these changes happening, um, it's weird to think that this uh, economic change, economic shift uh, to, towards a more liberalized economy, uh, which obviously with a lot of asterisks, with a huge grain of salt, but it has somewhat improved the situation in the country. It's weird to think that it it comes as a result. In, in, a, in a big part, at least, from U.S. sanctions. The, you know, the, the perspective from those who are uh, advocates against sanctions, you know, in, in the U.S., in Europe, um, in Twitter, we all know these guys. Uh, they usually blame the situation of what's going on in Venezuela to sanctions. It's not, you know, the mismanagement of the economy. It's not the corruption. It's the sanctions. But... In reality, the sanctions have actually had a somewhat positive effect in the economy. So what do you think of that? Well, I'm not an economist, so it's not a topic that I'd like to talk about as an authority. But, um, well, sanctions have definitely, on one side, affected the oil production. That's a fact. Um, but on the other side, if, if we follow, for example, a NOAA study, it seems that they have also pushed for greater liberalization. Because Venezuela is a petro state, practically a monoproductive country that depends on oil. And the moment, you know, oil um, starts to, like, stops flowing, the government needed our revenue. And the way to do that it was to open it. Well, other people say that the fact that so many people um, related to the government was sanctioned or their visas removed um, push the new um, ruling class to invest their money in the country because they didn't have where to put it yeah the bolivarian bourgeois yeah yeah so that's why you have like new hotels and new restaurants and all that but um despite all these i believe that people who are blaming the, the humanitarian situation in venezuela on sanctions they haven't really studied the situation because um the, the collapse of the country happened before the strongest sanctions came into effect and and it's a fact that practically the, the Venezuelan government simply cut their subsidies and imports and, and, and for food and medicine to pay the debt they, they created. Mm -hmm. So um, they also expropriated the factories here, destroying national production when it became unproductive. So um, most, 
if not all, but most of the of the reasons of the crisis are found domestically. That the economy was already ravaged before sanctions. Sanctions were just a new level. On the, the cherry on, on the, top. The cherry. Yeah, on the top. cherry on top. Now, I want to ask you uh, about your article. Uh, something that I found interesting and I didn't know. Um, well, I knew that uh, you mentioned that there's a, a, a push in the government, in the Venezuelan government, of trying to appeal to uh, the middle class people through social media, trying to portray mm -hmm. uh, this image of normalization of, look, we're actually a normal country. Look at all these things we have and um, influencers that... You know, it's really hard to tell whether or not they're actually, you know, influencers, like independent influencers, like giving their opinion as to what they're seeing in Venezuela or, you know, if there's something behind that. Mm -hmm. uh, so what, talk to me about that, like movement that we see in social media to like trying to portray this image as Venezuela being a normal country. Yeah. So the, the government has been, um, has been pushing a story of recovery recently like maduro has talked a lot about economic recovery la recuperación económica mm -hmm. and it's it's you know it's not only that they've been saying that migrants are actually coming back and is that and, you true know, i mean six percent according to the latest national poll by the catholic university that's nothing out of six millions like yeah people are coming back but it's only a fraction mm -hmm. of of the whole diaspora And the government says that 60% of the diaspora is coming back. That's like 10 times higher than yeah. the, the independent estimates. Yeah. <laughs> so um, the thing is that with that narrative, there's also a, like a, a, a set of videos and tweets and content has appeared on social media promoting the same narrative, but it's not explicitly or, or directly related to any government or state agency. But it's quite mysterious. There's out of the blue an account that nobody knows who owns it called Retornado Venezuela, literally Returnees Venezuela, that appears in YouTube, in YouTube and it posts videos of like cartoon videos which require, you know, an investment in money. Production, to yeah, of course. Yeah, showing um, migrants as these dumb people who were um, misguided by the propaganda of the opposition and are now cleaning kitchens and bathrooms in Peru while their friends in Venezuela in the videos are having huge parties and eating in restaurants and investing in new it, things. It's so malicious. It's, it's, it is. Oh my God. I hate them. It, it's trying to, to, you know, to, in a way to, to make people think that's true. Like people abroad, they don't know what's happening. If you see an Instagram story, you see a party and you see a restaurant and it's true. Those things are happening, but that's not the whole reality of the country. That's the reality of a certain part of the country with a certain income um so they they are you know they're, they're posting these videos there's there's a bat flying out of my window in plain daylight okay, a bat sorry. yeah holy shit <laughs> a really big bat yeah sorry i got distracted go ahead go ahead okay so <laughs> weird <laughs> so um they also made like there's this influencer on tiktok he's not related to any estate agency or TV channel, but he's always posting videos to show how good Venezuela is and how the crisis <laughs> is an invention of the media abroad. And here's the thing. Yes, things are, are better for a part of the population. Yes, those restaurants are real. Those shopping malls are full. But it's not the whole reality. Both things are true. Also, it's not true that everything happening here is money laundering. That's also another Important. fabrication on the other side of the political spectrum. But the um, thing is that This guy is not related to, to any account, but he's posting these stories. He's posting videos showing a reggaeton version of a story that Maduro now won. Latin America is socialist. Inflation arrives to the U.S. And everybody's having fun here, opening new businesses and going to Los Roques and Canaima to vacation. And, and so on. Like, there's another journalist on Twitter who is not aligned with anything explicitly. And she's posting, you know, it gets a political undertone because she's posting, like, This is how Maduro represses, the dictatorship of Maduro represses people on the weekends. And it shows people partying on a beach. <sighs> yeah, it, it, so, so it goes like that. And, and, and then there's a whole set of TikToks with very, you know, sketchy people posting them. 
that talk about Venezuela premium and it shows you like right. Rolex in Caracas and nightclubs and hotels and Ferraris, Teslas. Yeah, like... and it's it's like look how cool this is, but but it's it's so frivolous, you know, and it's it's shown in a way that it's very Nova Rich, you know? It is, it is. It's like the I think that I think that you know since the um, since the revolution since you know the, the the early 2000s and moving on to all the shit that has happened uh, ever since um there was always the old elite the old ruling class right many of them many of them just plain up like just left the country but a lot mm -hmm. of them stayed there yeah kind of like quiet right quietly and of course there's a the new bourgeois you know people that are somewhat associated with the regime might be someone in the military might be mm -hmm. someone in um in the government and uh, they were also doing their stuff pretty quietly now it seems that the like you said it's not just money laundering or at least that's my impression again mm -hmm. you know, you know no, me I, I, you, you, you you're not an economist I, i'm not even a journalist i'm just seeing what i perceive from from my little window right but yeah. it's this new ruling class that it's now being openly wealthy uh yeah. and, and, and and like being very vocal about how wealthy they are and yeah. of course you know you have uh everyone in the middle right like the the middle class those who stayed back home and you know not now uh because they're professionals because they have their own businesses now they can perceive you know income in in in, in u.s dollars uh something that is bizarre and i still don't get it and maybe you can give me a little bit more context because the uh you're in venezuela right now is mm -hmm. that as i understand it even though the economy is liberalized and you can use mm -hmm. U.S. dollars to pay for pretty much everything, a lot of things are actually more expensive in Venezuela than what they are, say, in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and uh, any any other country uh, that, that uses any uh, normal yeah. currency. So, how how does it like how does it even work? How, how do people yeah. survive? Like just just to give you like a, a like a personal anecdote, I have a friend who recently moved to Canada. And um, we went to do groceries, right? We go, we spend, we see the bill, and he's shocked. And I think that he's shocked because it's like, in my head, it's like, oh my God, this is too expensive, right? Like $200 for groceries. And he's actually telling me like, no, this is like so cheap. I would have spent four or $500 for the same amount of groceries in Minnesota. So how, yeah. how does that work? How do people survive having like an inflated dollar? So th the thing is that, there's a lot of inequality right now and 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 i believe that's going to have political implications in the following years because um there's estimations from econalytica and from anova for example they they estimate that in the private sector people were you know having 60 dollars a month in 2018 and now they're doing 150 and from last year the rise has been of 20% but at the same time from last year, the prices in dollars, not even the Bolivar inflation, which is higher, went up 50%. That's five times higher than the rest of the world, which is going an inflationary crisis. So we do have a very rapid uh, dollar inflation that is definitely cutting any, you know, any, any promise that this perestroika has. So... Um, I, I think that's one of the reasons why we're seeing a, a slower consumption rate right now and also why people seem to be a bit more frustrated with uh, an opening that was promising a change some like a year ago. So so the thing is that this dollar inflation, people are like, oh, you know, the businessmen, they're, they're abusadores, they're abusing us. They're speculating, they're, they're speculating, yeah. Speculators, yeah. yeah. And the thing is that, first of all, production is extremely expensive in Venezuela because you have to pay for extra electricity because you have blackouts, you have to pay for extra water, you have to pay for direct connections to gas. There's no new technology. There's very few skilled personnel staff right now. So um, production ends up being very expensive and you have to pay so many um, police checkpoints to let you go and not take your, your, your goods away. And at the same time, people are importing. And on one hand, those imports 
are actually cheaper than what's being produced. So you have Nestlé in Venezuela producing things, and then someone imports Nestlé product products from abroad, yeah, which are cheaper. Yeah. So you're actually put jeopardizing the future of the transnationals that still remain in Venezuela. And on the other hand, when these things arrive on on La Guaira or on Puerto Cabello or whatever port, um, you have to pay corrupt officials to let them in and you have to give them a part of the goods and then you have to pay the same checkpoint. So things that end up, you know, g gaining more, um, um, you know, higher prices and you're importing them, which is an extra price on, on services that are designed for that. And with such a limited market where people are actually preferring prices now than quality, you cannot even develop, uh, I don't know if the term in English is the same in Spanish, but it's economia escala. It's like an economy in scales. So a, a businessman in another country could sell you a big book and a little book for different prices, but you don't have such a big market. So you're just going to take out the big book, whoever can afford the big book right. or big product, you know? Yeah. So, so it, it ends, it ends up being really expensive and there's not enough economic reforms or deep enough economic reforms to, to actually so move move us to a real competitive market i um for those of you who don't know tony yet i like encourage you to follow this guy this is like one of the best journalists in venezuela and he posts posts in spanish and english no you are you are uh, yeah. be proud be proud of the work that you do because it, it is amazing i thank you for it one mm -hmm. of the things that you were saying um a few weeks ago um mm -hmm. you were reporting on what uh Enkobi, um I yep. said, uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, which is really one of the few uh, mm -hmm. reliable sources of you know economic indicators uh, in the country, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, I think uh, the index of poverty specifically um, mm -hmm. it was reduced. Uh, I think it was at 1.95 percent. I think we're now like down to 83, 82 percent, and so on. And um, it is not a secret that this. Um, economic miracle not really miracle economic i will say uh barrabasia i don't even know how to say it in english like whatever the heck is happening in venezuela it's very localized to the big cities and specific parts of the big cities like you see that in caracas you see that in lecheria uh, some places in maracaibo how about the rest of the country how about the 80 percent of the population do they still depend on the government? Has the government aid, uh, the, the, the food boxes, the, the, the grants, the uh, public services, has, has that seen any change or it's only continued to gotten worse? Okay, so um, there's a lot to unpack here. So the first thing is that, yeah, the, the economic recovery is very limited to cities and to certain areas, but it's actually very widespread because of dollarization. So if you see the, they did a recent poll about um, small rural areas only, small rural towns, and it actually showed certain improvements in certain areas, but others, there was, there was worsening, like in electricity or public services. But um, in general, the effects of the perestroika, if we call it that, um, held in a lot of places. Yeah, the banana stroika. <laughs> so, but it's also as Encovi shows, very geographically um, unequal because according to Encovi, 60% uh, of all households in Venezuela are found in Caracas. 60%? But at the same time, yeah, 16. Oh, 16. Okay. Yeah, 16, 16. But at the same time, 40% of all rich households are in Caracas. Oh, there you go. Okay. So Caracas is disproportionately rich. And, you know, Econalytic at the same time, well, they say 37% of rich households. Econalytic at the same time says that Caracas is 40% of the GDP. Basically, almost half of the GDP is one city, the capital. Damn. So, yeah. That's inequality. So they, yeah, it's, it's big inequality, as well as geographically and social. So, um, now, regarding the state in this situation, the Venezuelan state has been greatly reduced recently like um it, it's it has just and it's not a like oh we're gonna reduce it it's it's just that it has fallen apart and it doesn't have the capacity neither the will to to act as it used to be um you know we saw the for months in the summer this protest by the teachers the public sector teachers saying they wanted their bonuses which were cut 
from their salaries. And when the government finally paid them the, the, the bonuses without eliminating the new rules, the Bolivar crashed like so much. So that's how fragile our, our economy is right now. Like the government is just paying a big amount of money and, and the currency crashes. Because they don't pay in US dollars. Yeah, they don't pay in US dollars. So it's, it's you know, on one side, you, you want to keep the public sector teachers happier, not happy, happier. <laughs> um, and on the other side, you're crushing the economy. It's very difficult. So you can see how weak the state is nowadays. But according to COVID, around 80% of the population still receive the clap boxes. Or, well, now they're clap bags, I think. So it's, it's you know, rural areas and poor areas, they receive these by paying a really, really small amount of money. These are the food it, bags that the government gives away. Yeah, they get food bags. But, you know, these food, food bags, they rarely or usually have no protein, for example. So it's, yeah, it's a way of, of, of keeping hunger at bay, but it's not a form of, of making the population, you know, uh, making them more nutritious in, in the way they consume so, or having access to better food. So we have a situation where the state we've come, which, which swifted from shifted, sorry, from a very con a government that had big control over the population, over what they ate, over their public services, over what they consume, over their jobs, etc. They have shifted towards this, um, economic liberalization that, as we discuss, mainly, you know, only benefits uh, one-fifth of Venezuelans, if not less than that. Um, and now we have this attempt of normalizing also the political situation in the country. Um, something that you mentioned in your article is that a lot of this narrative, a lot of this propaganda, it's aimed at the middle class. And when mm -hmm. we were discussing this before, uh, before electricity went out, um, we did, we started having a conversation, um, about how all this goes together, not like the economic situation and the propaganda goes together with what the plans of the government are in terms of what they're going to do with the elections and the campaigns that they're going to run and all that. So, and one thing that it's not clear to me, and we're like we're gonna discuss about that. And sorry that I'm asking such lengthy questions, but you know, I, I just want to get my idea out there. Um, the government really depended for votes from the poor classes, from the people who are now struggling the most, from the people who are not accessing U.S. dollars, from the people who had less and less help by the government every day. So, is the government just abandoning their 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 base of uh, their electoral base and like aiming towards uh, gaining votes from the, the Venezuelan middle class is this just going to be a democracy of the wealthy now or, or or how 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 does that all come together no no i i don't think that's that's what happening precisely so yeah this um narrative it's being pushed for the middle class especially um but what they're trying to do is not to, to make the middle class vote Chavismo. That's never going to happen. These people are, they are ad identified, not necessarily with the opposition core, like with the, the opposition leadership, but with anti-Chavismo as a whole. They have been voting anti-Chavez since the year 2000, and they will continue, and their children will probably do the same. thing is that right now, this sector of the population, which has historically been the core of the opposition, especially Eastern Caracas, um, they're very disappointed with the opposition and with the system. If we see the last election, the regional elections we had in 2021, the highest um, abstention rates where people didn't vote were in Eastern Caracas, which used to be the core of the opposition. You know, in, in the three richest municipalities, more than 70% of the people didn't vote, which is a quite contrast with previous years. Mm -hmm. Then if we see the rural side where the historic Chavista heartland was, people voted in mass for the opposition. And actually they won the state of Barinas where Chavez was born, which is like the Bethlehem of Chavismo. Twice. They won twice. twice. <laughs> yeah, because they forced a repetition of the elections and the opposition won again. Yeah. So if you see the results, in fact, most of the country voted for the opposition, but the opposition was so divided in different factions that Chavismo won most of the governorships. Um, 
and 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 well you know opposition in a very wide use of the term but parties not aligned explicitly with PSOE, with the, with the socialists. Yep. So what I think they're doing is that on one side, you want to keep docile the opposition core. You don't want them to vote. You want them to stay skeptical of the government and not participating in common electoral processes. People are like, if they're allowing me to work, if they're allowing me to invest, if they're allowing me to, to, to have my company functioning, then I'm not going to get into politics anymore. The opposition is dumb and corrupt and whatever, so I'm fine like that. On the other hand, they're selling a fantasy that things are getting better and we're going back to the good old times. And soon you people of the countryside could have access to this fantasy too. So they're trying to showcase that image throughout the country that there's like, we're finally getting back together and it's no longer political and it's no longer the eyes of Chavez, but it's rather an era of happiness and patriotism. And Venezuela is finally getting fixed because sanctions are being lifted. So that's the narrative. Wow. So on one side, you're trying to regain an electorate that abandoned you. And on the other side, you're trying to keep docile an electorate that will always vote against you, will always go against you. And that has rose previously and brought the country into fire and turmoil many times against your government. So yes. you want to keep them docile. I hate, I hate Chavez. If one thinks those guys are clever, or at least they have good advisors as to They're very clever. <laughs> They're very clever. Okay. So, um, I guess one final question um, that I have for you, and this is this is something that I've and, been... Oh, let, let me say one more thing. I'll um, go for it. Sorry go to interrupt it. you. If, if you see polls by Moore Consulting, in 2017, they registered like 80% rejection of Maduro's or disapproval mm. of Maduro's government. Nowadays, it's around like 65. Oh, God, it's going down. So, it's so working. people are actually looking at the things getting better, and they're like, yeah, maybe he's... He's, you know, his government is not that bad. We and we're approaching elections. So Maduro is, is trying to improve that so they can negotiate some sort of competitive elections with the opposition, win, regain legitimacy internationally, and have sanctions removed. <laughs> it's it's so sick because like they, they take advantage of the fact that we haven't had democracy for such a long time that people don't really know how to react to these things, right? So they see an improvement, they're just gonna say, well, maybe Maduro is not that bad. Uh, It's, I hate them. All right, so my one final question. Uh, this this podcast always gets gloomy because we talk about too much about Venezuela. We should be talking about Luxembourg. I don't know. Um, <laughs> is there a chance? I've been wondering this. So mm -hmm. if the things continue to go the way that they're going, mm -hmm. uh, out, geopolitically speaking, if you know sanctions get lifted, mm -hmm. relations with Venezuela get normalized, Venezuela... Mm -hmm. Because a you know somewhat normal nation in the political in the international stage, is there an incentive to continue to go in this direction of liberalization, or is there a possibility that they might go 180 and go back to the control that they had before? Well, three days ago or two days ago, the government approved again price controls. Um, but it's been so weird. It was like an announcement on social media and they then they deleted it. It's not official yet. So you can see how our politics are managed right now, our economy. Um, so I, you know, I'm, I'm not a witch. <laughs> I cannot know the future, but um, I, I think that Chavism shouldn't be understood as a, you know, as a political irrational force, but rather as a force of, of different factions working for their inter interest and at the same time moved by very emotional stuff. You know, I, I believe that that resentment is a moving force of many factions of Chavismo. And and we know that the most orthodox factions of Chavismo are not happy with this happening. And these factions move the basis of Chavismo. So mm -hmm. um, I, 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 I don't know. Like, I can tell you that I'm pretty sure this is not going to head to full fledged capitalism this is not going to be china because we don't even have a a judicial framework that protects private property you know the uh, el Aysami tried to promote a new oil law in in the chavist assembly that was pretty liberal and it didn't pass <laughs> it didn't manage to get the votes of the most orthodox chavista and, and I, i believe that that 
that's why this perestroika is so limited and it's reaching a point of ex ex exhaustion, like of, of fatigue, you know? Um, but I'm not sure if, if there's going to be a full return if things get completely normalized. For the simple fact that a big chunk of the of the of business class, I wouldn't say the majority, but definitely a big part of it, is related to the government now. And and you don't want the volley bourgeoisie to turn against you. But well, we saw the Soviet Union doing its new economic policy, and they ended up actually fucking their their businessmen, the NEB men. So who knows? I I I think it's a matter of what side of Chavismo will will end up dominating the scene. But I definitely don't believe we're going to get to a very capitalist point. But I'm not sure we're also going to return to full socialism either. Some people have said that Venezuela is on its way of becoming Saudi Arabia. Um, I'm like more, eh, I don't know. I think we're going more Somalia uh, type of situation. Myanmar. Uh, Myanmar, stuff like that. Uh, Tony, thank you so much for coming. Thank uh, you. This, this interview has been on the make for a while now. Um, <laughs> glad to have you on the show. You're always welcome. Uh, if you have, thank you. If you ever thank want you to come back invite. and talk about anything, you know, any new article, any interesting thing, or you just want to, you know, just want to just want to have a conversation and, you know, a cathartic conversation and talk about all the shitty things that's happening in Venezuela. Uh, you're always more than welcome to come. Uh, thank you so much, Edu. Take it easy. Bye, Tony. Bye. Take care. Bye, guys.